Let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Father, we love you and we thank you so very much. We thank you for this day. We thank you for all your blessings. We thank you for everybody who's here today, Father, and the new people that are here as well. Father, I ask that you help everybody get something good out of this message today. Truly let your presence be felt and known today. As that curtain was ripped in half, Father, let it be known that you are with us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. <clears throat> today, we're talking about should we follow the full Old Testament? Now, the short answer is no. All right? We could all walk out of here. All right? <laughs> but the long answer is as follows. <clears throat> so these are the things that we no longer have to observe that are in the Old Testament. Some people are like, why don't we follow the whole Bible? I mean, what's, what's the deal with that? There's some things we do and some things we don't do. Well, hopefully maybe this message will kind of clear some of that up. Some things we don't have to observe anymore are the dietary laws that were in the Old Testament. Certain things you couldn't eat, all right? So that means we couldn't have bacon. We couldn't have ham. Sinar, all that good stuff. We couldn't have shrimp. Oh, my goodness. Bacon-wrapped shrimp. Come on, Lord. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't have that. Couldn't have lobsters. Oh, my goodness. Couldn't have snow crabs. What? Man. That's good. I know. All the variations of crab are out there. Yeah, we have, can't have no catfish either. Well, I think that there's certain types of fish that you could have, and I don't know all that, but there were certain things you couldn't have, so that's the bottom point of it. All right? There were sacrificial laws that you had to observe, but we don't have to do that no longer. There were certain animals you had to sacrifice every year for certain sins and certain things. And I mean, I mean to tell you, we'd be in some hard times right now. Living in America, we'd have to travel to Israel to do this. All right? You couldn't just do it here. You had to go all the way to Israel to do your sacrificing. All right? So we'd be in some hard times if we had to still observe all that today. Yeah. Yeah. There were certain of, uh, observing of feast, feast days. They had several feast days that you had to observe, all right? We don't have to do that any longer. And then also it says that we don't have to observe the Sabbath either. And I'll get to the scripture that explains that. <clears throat> but what scriptures, what specific commands do we not have to obey anymore? All right, now there's too many for me to list. But I picked out some that I was just like, wow, you know, I'm thankful we don't have to observe these anymore. <laughs> so, like I said, the unclean food was one. So let's go to Leviticus 11, 4, and 7. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat, the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. So he was saying... We can't eat pigs, all right? That's the bottom line of that. We cannot eat pigs. And I know that would change a lot of our breakfast schedule up a little bit. It would change up some of our favorite foods, would it not? Couldn't put bacon and green beans anymore. Come on. Bacon, sausage, all that good stuff. Man, that would be hard for us, wouldn't it? But thankfully, we don't have to do that anymore. Thank you, Lord. Started out right. I don't have to do that anymore. All right. So <clears throat> the next thing is mixed clothing. What? Deuteronomy 22.11. You shall not wear a garment of different sorts, such as wool and linen mixed together. We'd be in some hard times for that, too. I bet you if you go through your closet, you sit, you read on the little tag it's saying like two or three different types of materials in there. You'd have to throw it all out. Just cotton or just whatever. That would be hard to deal with, huh? <clears throat> all right. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about that anymore. All right. Uncleanness. All right. Now, this is getting a little graphic. I'm sorry for some of the squeamish people out there. but Leviticus 15, 19. 
If a woman has a discharge, and the discharge from her body is blood, she shall be set apart seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. So women, whenever you're on your menstrual cycles, you had to be put out of the camp. All right? Now, sometimes that might be good for the men. (laughs) Don't have to listen to all that aggravation going on. So for seven days, you couldn't be at your house. You had to go pitch a tent somewhere, all right? Wouldn't that be hard for you if you had to do that nowadays? Because that's pretty regular, right? (laughs) Man, I bet that would be tough. And then even if somebody touched you, they would have to be considered unclean too. I'm just going to read. So, wow. Thank you, Lord. We don't have to deal with that anymore. Amen. The next one is stoning. All right? Deuteronomy 21, 20 through 21. And they shall say to the elders of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Wow. Y'all rebellious children out there. (laughs) You better count your lucky stars. We don't live in those days. Y'all would get stoned to death. Thank you, Lord, that you have done away with all of that from what Jesus did on the cross. Thank you, Lord. All right, now here comes the sacrificing. Second Chronicles 29, 20 through 24. Then King Hezekiah rose early, gathered the rulers of the city, and went up to the house of the Lord, and they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom, for the sanctuary, and for Judah. Then he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So they killed the bulls, and the priests received the blood and sprinkled it on the altar. Likewise, they killed the rams and sprinkled the blood on the altar. They also killed the lambs and sprinkled the blood on the altar. Then they brought out the male goats of the sin offering before the king and the assembly. And they laid their hands on them, and the priests killed them. And they presented their blood on the altar as a sin offering to make atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering be made for all Israel. All right, now this is just one type of sacrificing that had to go on. There was many different types. And these all happened various times throughout the year. I'm going to tell you, I probably wouldn't be in the ministry if I still had to do that. All right? Killing all these different animals and having to sprinkle the blood everywhere all the time. That would get old, let me tell you. But Jesus took care of all that. One time, one time, one shot, one deal for us on the cross. Alright? So this this going through the Old Testament helps you understand what we don't have to do anymore. It gives you a better understanding and a better appreciation what Jesus actually did on the cross for you. So that's why I'm talking about this and also showing you how much freedom we have in Christ. How much liberty He has given us. It's amazing. Alright, now we come to the Sabbath. Leviticus 23.3 Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now this is one we probably don't mind, right? Hey, I don't have to do nothing on the Sabbath. Thank you, Lord. Now, that wasn't Sunday, okay? As we know, Sunday is the first day of the week, all right? So, the seventh day of the week is actually Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, okay? That's the actual Sabbath day, okay? So, from that time frame, if y'all ever had to work late on Friday, you could say, hey, boss, I'm out of here. I'm on the Sabbath, you know? But the bad thing about it, though, is you couldn't do any work. You couldn't travel. That was considered work. So any kind of family vacations, forget about it. If it happens on the Sabbath, you can't go. All right? You can't be traveling. And there, you couldn't even prepare food. You had to have your, your food prepared a day beforehand. Because if you did any work, 
at all, you were breaking that law. Okay? So, whew. some points of it are good, some points are not. All right? But thankfully, he has done away with that. All right? Now we come to the feasts. Leviticus 23. <clears throat> it talks about all the feasts that you must keep. All right? Now, you can go read that on your own time. That was too much for me to have to read for you all today. But if you want to go check out Leviticus 23, it talks about so many. It talks about the Passover, the unleavened bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And there were certain different things you had to do for each of those feasts to fulfill that feast day. It wasn't just like going to a carnival. All right, It wasn't just like having Thanksgiving. There were certain things you were required to do during these feasts. All right? <clears throat> So in other words, it wasn't just having a good time. Now there was celebration too, but you know. So how come we stopped having to observe all this? God created a new covenant with all of mankind. See, the old covenant was just for the Jews to observe. All right, He had a lot of strict laws to keep them separated from other cultures. All right? Some of y'all are thinking, man, that was too much bad stuff. That was too harsh, God. But a lot of these things God had to put in place because the world around them was so wicked. All right, He was trying to strike out wicked the best way He could. And He had to impose these harsh laws to try to do that, but also to show us later that no one could ever fully observe the old covenant. That's why He said He would bring a new covenant. And that's what we're fixing to read right now. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And as we see, with the whole world. Anybody who wants to come to Jesus Christ can have Him. You don't have to follow those Old Testament laws anymore. Some of, the, some of them you do. All right. Now, some things He hasn't done away with. Like... It's still a sin to murder somebody, right? All right. Now, there's, there's a difference from sacrificial laws and things like that and moral laws. Moral laws still stand. Anything God says that is wrong or bad to do, uh, like fornication and getting drunk and things like that, that's still wrong today. All right. But certain practices are done away with, thankfully. Matthew 26 and 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So Jesus' blood is what is the remission of sins. All right? His death on the cross. 2 Corinthians 3 6 through 7. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit. For the letter kills. He's basically saying, for the law kills. And as we see, sometimes it really does, the stoning and all that stuff, you know. But the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, he's talking about the, the Ten Commandments, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not even steadily look at the face of Moses. They couldn't even look at him. All right? Because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away. All right? So Hebrews 8, 7 and 8. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. In that, he says, a new covenant he has made, the first obsolete. So he made the first covenant obsolete. The, first, the Old Testament is obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to, va to uh, vanish away. So... The new covenant has completely replaced the old covenant. All right? Yes, we have adopted some things from the old covenant. That's what God did. Some things still apply. Okay? But He has done away with it completely. 
All right? He has made a new thing, a new covenant, a new testament for us to follow. So the majority of our reading should be in the New Testament. Go back and read the Old Testament, see what it was like, get some good things from it. But I want you to focus the majority of your reading in the New Testament because that is where we are. Okay? You can get really confused bouncing back and forth. All right? Trust me. And as I, as I read this next thing, you'll understand. All right? <clears throat> so why don't we have to obey the dietary laws? So when I first became a true Christian, I started reading the Bible from Genesis on. Who else did that? Who else has just started from Genesis and went on? Let me just tell you, doing that, you can get really confused. Really quick. <laughs> I mean to tell you, when I got to the part where it said that you can't eat uh, pork anymore and you can't eat shellfish, I about had a heart attack. <laughs> I mean to tell you. Because I lived at the beach. I grew up at the beach, all right? So seafood was just a red That was my regular diet, all right? Shrimp and all that good stuff. Couldn't have it anymore. What? After I got the reading, I went downstairs and almost with a tear in my eyes, Mom, I can't eat this food anymore. I was upset, all right? As any of us probably would be. And my mom was like, I don't think we have to worry about that anymore. And I was like, oh, i got to ask my pastor. So I went and asked the pastor and he said, yeah, that's that's the Old Covenant, that's the Old Testament, don't have to worry about that anymore. And they showed me in the New Testament, as I'll get to here in a second, where that is done away with. And I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That was about to be too much for me. I would have did it, but I mean, it would have been hard. Like I said, that's some of my favorite food. All right? So let's go and see what, why. How did they do away with it? Acts 10, 9 through 16. The next day, as they went out on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened up and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common or unclean. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. So I want to show you, I want to tell you right now, Peter's sitting up there on, on this rooftop, and he falls into this trance, and he sees the sheep coming down to him. And it's got all these different animals who he's never eaten before because it was against the law, because they were called unclean. All right? God says, what I have cleansed, what I have made clean, don't call unclean. Now, how did he do that? He did it by the cross. All right? did it by the cross. So he cleansed all of these animals. Now if God wasn't being literal here, was would Peter's response be, oh you don't actually want me to eat those things? You just told me I could. You mean you have a completely different meaning for this? See some people teach, oh well God wasn't really meaning you can eat those things. Isn't that ridiculous? Isn't that what God just said? Rise up, kill them, and eat them? Peter would be really confused if that wasn't what God really was meaning. All right. Now, yes, there is a better meaning. God has more meaning behind that, that he was meaning not only have I cleansed animals, but if I've cleansed animals, I've cleansed mankind as well. So if I've cleansed Animals who have no spirit or no soul, what makes you think I'm not going to cleanse mankind? 
And when you become a Christian, when you have God in your life, when you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, you become cleansed as well. No matter what you've done in your life. Many of us get stained by the sins of this world. We get stained, and I'm telling you, it gets on you. When you sin, when you live a lifestyle of sin, that stain starts caking on you. The grit, the grime, the nastiness of sin. But when you get cleansed, you get fully washed. It's like walking through a holy car wash. Who's ever been through a car wash before? Have you ever did the maximum clean? Who's ever done the max clean? you got to spend... Oh, that's the amount of money as you got to get it, but it's like $18 or something, some places. But it cleans everything. I mean, you got those little octopus things that goes down. Flops all over your car, cleans that, shoots up underneath, shoots all around, gives you the wax treatment, gives you everything. That's what God does to you. He will cleanse every thing, single thing about you. Your mind, your body, your actions. He will cleanse your word. He'll cleanse everything if you let Him. That was the main point, but it does not negate the secondary point of Him saying that you can kill and eat those things that are unclean now. Alright? 1 Timothy 4, 1-5 through now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, basically telling people you can't marry nobody, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving, by those who believe and know the truth. Hear this word now. This is a key word. For every creature of God is good, and nothing, nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Does anybody pray over your meals? Amen. Amen. Sometimes you need to, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little burnt. <laughs> Sometimes you're not too sure about it. you got to pray over it, all right? Lord will help cleanse it, sanctify it by the word of God and prayer. Thank you for that. <clears throat> so why don't we have to obey the, feastival, the festivals and Sabbaths? So let's go ahead and read Colossians 2, 14 through 17, and then 20 through 21. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, all those little requirements, some of them which I read to you, all those little handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he was taking it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Meaning he took, he, refit, he fulfilled the requirements of all those ordinances. All those little requirements, He fulfilled it on the cross for us. Having disarmed the principalities and powers, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. So that no one judge you in food or in drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths. So He's saying... Don't let those Jews come in and try to tell you you have to keep doing these to be right with God. Don't let them tell you you have to keep obeying all of this stuff. Okay? Then he goes on further to say, which are a shadow of things to come. So these things were all just a shadow. Okay? But the substance is of Christ. Meaning, the most important part of it is it was Jesus. Those things were a shadow of Jesus. A shadow of the things to come, which was Jesus and what He fulfilled. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? If you're free, 
if you have been made free by the cross, by Jesus Christ, by the blood of the Lamb, if you are in the new covenant, why are you trying to go back and do the old covenant? That one's done away with. Quit trying to do it. He says, do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. He's basically saying, don't go back to those old regulations, the things that don't even matter. <clears throat> See, the passage of Scripture shows that we aren't to let anyone judge us who are under the law of liberty and freedom of Christ. That's the law that we follow, the liberty and freedom of Christ. And we obey the laws that he has written on the tablets of our heart. That's what he said he would do. He said, I will write my law on your heart so that you will follow it. Now, I'm talking about the moral law now, not just those regulations and sacrificing things. All right? So thank you, Lord. Amen. He's meaning don't let people who are of the circumcision or the Jewish culture come in and get you to follow the old way of doing things. Because those things were just a shadow of the things to come. But the real substance is Christ, like I said, who is the fulfillment of all of it. And it is false humili humility to observe it. Don't subject yourselves to regulations. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. They have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion. And that's what it comes down to works-based religion. Alright? Now I agree we are to follow God's commandments, but some have been fulfilled and thus are no longer required for us to do them. See, what happens is, is man always tries to go back to religion. Now religion, some of us get confused on that term, religion is based on works. Alright? What you have in Christ is different than religion it is a relationship with the God of everything. That's the difference. That's the difference from the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is trying to get you to do right by the law. The New Testament is trying to get you to do right because you love God. Amen. You want to please God. That's the difference. Not because you have to, but because you want to. That's the difference. He can't make any of us right until we want to be right. Until we want what is good. That's He knew that that wasn't ever going to work. That was just a temporary fix. That was just to show people how much they really needed to do to be right. But he knew they never could do it. So he had to set up something new. He said, i got to send my son to die for them so that I can look at them through his blood. Through the sacrifice of what Jesus did on the cross, He looks at you different now. He looks at you as sons and daughters, not just servants. Alright? Because that's what you were through the Old Testament, just servants. Now we are friends and sons and daughters of the God of everything. Amen. That makes you want to do right, doesn't it? I want to please you. All what you did for me, I want to please you. I want to do what's right. I want to stop living in sin because I want to make you happy. I want to make you joyful. I want you to look down from heaven and say, there's my son. He's making me so proud. There's my daughter. She's doing right because she wants to. Not because I'm making her, but because she wants to. That's the kind of God that we have. That's the kind of God that we serve. And that's how we should look at it. And that's how we should be. We should want to do right because it is right and because it will please God. Let's go to Romans 14. 1 through 6 and then 13 and 14. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Man, if you're a vegetarian out there, power to you. But don't try to impose that on me. Because as I already said, there's certain foods I won't eat. I'm telling you. 
I want to have mistakes, all right? I want to have pork chops and trim. I want all the good stuff, chicken and all its delicious varieties. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who weak is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. So neither one of us should judge one another on that. You want to eat vegetables? Power to you. Don't judge me because I want to eat meat though. You know, I'm not going to judge you. You don't judge me, alright? Alright. So let him who eats, dis don't despise him who does not eat. And let him who does not eat, judge him who eats. For God has received him. God has received both of us. So who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. So he who eats, eats to the Lord and he gives thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more. But rather resolve this, not put a stumbling block or a cause to fall on our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that if there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So if you want to stop eating pork for your health reasons, power to you. That might actually improve your health. But don't tell someone else because you're eating pork you're sinning. See what I mean? Don't impose on them your own convictions. Because as we see through the Scripture, God has already done away with that. And if you want to follow the Jewish festivals, power to you. There's nothing wrong with you doing that. But don't tell someone else, if you don't do this, you're sinning. Alright? That's, that's, that's what it comes down to. Don't judge someone else on those things. Now, here is something. If you see another brother who is sinning, who is, let's say you know they're getting drunk all the time, and you confront them with it, hey brother, you know how God says in the Word not to be a drunkard? I'm just telling you because I love you. Please stop. That's okay. Alright? Don't. I don't want to get y'all confused now. It's okay to convict one another from sin. Alright? So don't say, don't. only God can judge me. Alright? God says that we can use righteous judgment. He says that we can convict, rebuke, and exhort with long-suffering. He says that. We can rebuke one another. If you see me sin, tell me. Sinning, not just some piddly thing you don't like me doing. Alright? Oh, you shuffle your papers too much up there, Pastor. I don't like that. No, I'm talking about if you see me sinning, tell me. Because I don't want to be sinning. I'm, it might have slipped my mind. Oh, I didn't realize that, you know? But make sure it's things on, on good grounds, all right? Let's make sure we're convicting one another or rebuking one another, things that actually matter, all right? Things that are of importance. That's what I want to be rebuked on, right? But don't run around, hey, this is what you're doing wrong, this is what you're doing wrong, this is what you're doing wrong. You know, don't do that either, all right? Nobody wants that. We have to make sure we do it in love, right? That's our mission. Because we all want to have good relationships with God. Alright? But we don't need to be policed by one another. Alright? Oh, you, you did that wrong. I'm sitting here waiting for people to do wrong. Oh, you, oh, you did that wrong. That's a sin. That's a sin. No, we have to make sure we pray about it first. Lord, help me to, to have the right words to tell them. Because when you're rebuked on anything, it's not good. Alright? You feel like Oh, oh, I cannot stand it. it. It eats me up. Oh, man. But if you're right, well, then I have to get right, right? She's right about it, God. I was sinning. I know I shouldn't have. Please forgive me. Be humble. Don't be prideful. Don't 
don't have a prideful spirit walking around thinking you're already there, you're already perfect. Who are you to correct me? I'm already there, I'm good. What you talking about? Check yourself, you know? We do need to check ourselves though. Amen. The Bible says to remove the plank out of your own eyes so that you can see clearly to help your brother remove the speck out of his eye. He doesn't say remove the plank and then just that's it, just keep working on yourself. He says remove the plank out of your eye so you can help your brother remove the speck out of their eye. Now some people have the plank and you might have the speck, but either way, pull them out, all right? All right, my final point. Some of you are like, oh, thank you, Lord. He's too long-winded. I can't help it. I get it. When I get up here, I, I just I just want to pour out. I study all week long so that I can get up here and just pour out to you. I can't wait. So I hope some of y'all are okay with that. Yes. yes. I got a few more points here and then we'll close. We like we like to listen. Good. I'm just tired and learning. I hear you. All right. In Acts 15:10, the early church rule on this matter of the law. Now, therefore, why put God to the test? to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers or we were able to bear. He was saying nobody could fulfill the law. Nobody could uphold that yoke that was around their neck. Now, a yoke was something that you would put on animals. You put it around their neck and they would help plow your gardens or plow your fields or whatever. It was to hold them in place. All right? to hold them secure to what their job needed to be. He's saying nobody could uphold that yoke. Nobody could fulfill the letter of the law, the Old Testament. Nobody could except for Jesus. He came and He fulfilled the Old Testament for us. And He has imparted that fulfillment to us. So now we get to walk with freedom, with liberty, not bound to those old ordinances and regulations anymore. Yes, we are still held to a high standard. Yes, we are still to obey the truth and word of God. But there are certain things, like I said today, that He has completely done away with. And I'm so thankful for that. i got four more scripture. Ephesians 2, 14-15 For He Himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. That was that big curtain I was telling you all about. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. Those little things I said we don't have to do anymore, that's what he's talking about. So as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Thankfully, he has abolished that old covenant. We are the new covenant, the New Testament. Romans 8, 3 through 6. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It is the Spirit inside the believer that we are to obey, to walk according to Jesus. It is the Holy Spirit's leading, the Holy Spirit's guiding, the Holy Spirit on the inside of you that we are to obey. Thank you, Lord. First Corinthians 15, 57. The strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We got the victory in Jesus. The victory. Thank you, Lord. We're all winners. Don't you like being a winner? Yes. Who likes losing stuff? I know I don't. But you're a victor in Jesus Christ. You're a winner in Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. 
For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. If you try going back to following the Old Testament, you say, oh, well, I don't need Jesus. Yeah, I heard about Jesus. That's fine and all. But I want to do this hard stuff. I like it. I like having all this extra regulations and ordinances. You're not going to make it to heaven. Okay? The old covenant is done away with. And we are in the new covenant era. And it is only through Jesus Christ that you can be saved. Now there are some Christians who still teach you have to obey the old law. Can you believe it? They still teach you ha you can't eat certain foods. You have to observe these festivals. You have to do this. You have to do that. Or you're not right with God. They might say you're still saved, but you're not right with God because you, you eat pork. Let's say the only thing that you do all that other stuff, but you have a little bacon in the morning. Well, you're not right with God. That's what they say. Well, thankfully, we aren't like that here. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about that. Thankfully, we rightly divide the word of truth. We read in the scriptures, oh, I don't have to do that anymore? Okay, throw it out. Don't try to keep holding on to it, all right? He's saying let go of it. I've given you freedom and liberty. So live that way. And then if we are already doing that, be thankful this morning. Now you know why you can be extra thankful. Now you know why you can praise God. Oh, I don't have to worry about all that hard stuff anymore. It's awesome now. It feels good. Can you breathe? Do you feel like, ooh. Now what if I told you you had to do all that stuff? You'd feel like, oh man, this is hard. Lord, I don't know if I can do it. Because it's a yoke, it's a bondage. Thankfully, Lord, God done away with it on the cross.